Okay, let's probably get started if anyone joins mm -hmm. later. There is a video recording available. Seems so good. Should yeah. be. Okay, uh, so uh, I'd like to talk about the current implementation of Syntax Tree Rust Analyzer. I think that like a lot of details uh, should be changed to make it like more efficient, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the general idea seems uh, great to me. Like not because it's like a great idea, but because other projects like Rosly and or Swift are trying to use it. So it seems like a reasonable, a reasonable theory that it should work for us as well. But like macros can throw a wrench into the details. I have actually an issue on a Rust Analyzer repository about like finalizing the design of syntax trees. So if you have any thoughts after the meeting, you probably should uh, paste the comments on this issue uh, 862. Uh, currently this issue basically have a list of requirements and I'd like to briefly went through them to understand why are we doing things the way we do them. So like the two primary constraints on the syntax tree, the idea is, is that the syntax tree must be file fidelity in that it must maintain all uh, white space and comments and parentheses, etc, etc. Uh, ideally, uh, like, uh, it should maintain them in a like, more or less explicit form so that you can actually have a white space node and you can like uh, take a look at the node to the left and the node to the right. Like you could just store a source text alongside the tree and say that this is a full fidelity implementation, but I fear that won't be too useful for IDs. The second important uh, requirement is that uh, the parsing itself must be error tolerant. Uh, what I mean is that if you throw any vetted UTF-8 text at the parser, it must produce some kind of a source tree, which should uh, be full fidelity and represent this like completely garbage text, uh, text 100% correct. Ideally, parsing should also uh, figure out fragments of Rust source code in this garbage text and like uh, produce best effort syntax tree, even if it doesn't match the grammar of Rust exactly. What I mean is that like, for example, in Rust grammar, each struct must have a name, but uh, we must allow for syntax tree to have a struct uh, which has no name. It has just like struct keyword or maybe like a list of fields. Okay. Uh, other requirements like are probably less important, but also quite important. Uh, the interesting bit here is probably uh, representing a hygienic macro expansion uh, because we certainly can imagine a situation and for example, like, we use one syntax tree for macro expansion and the other syntax tree for like actual ID features. Uh, but I fear that like it could work, but it would mean duplicated effort, et cetera, et cetera. So if we could use a single syntax tree to do like low level compiler work, like macro expansion and then resolution and like just ID for fidelity work, that would be great. And yeah, another interesting bit that ID probably needs, it's like not 100% crucial, but pretty important is like, ability to use parent pointers and absolute offsets with the tree. So like, because in a compiler, you typically take a root node of some like function or something else and like walk it in top down manner and only inspect in children. In ID, you typically start with an offset in a file and you locate a node at this offset and uh, traverse the tree upwards to find like a function with this offset. So like parent pointers are pretty important. Can, can I push back on that just a little? Uh, I mean, at least in the RLS, for example, like what you really want is the ability to find a, the nodes that intersect a, a line column, right? At the end of the day, a cursor position or something like that. And parent pointers are certainly one way to do it. I mean, I think we may want them anyway, but like you could also traverse the tree from the top and find the, the match, right? And you may wind up doing that in order, because you have to search, you have to index it by offset anyway. When you get a request in from the ID, you get like, this is the line and column, right? Not here's a node. Yeah, that could work as well. Basically, like if you have information about offsets that basically isomorphic to having like parent uh, ch child relationship because like something is parent of something if, if the text offset is within the extent of the parent node. So, but, 
like kind of functional processing, it's still useful to like just take a look at the parent struct and like to figure out what kind of node is it. Like for example, okay, so uh, you have an offset and like you figured out that you are uh, at the identifier. And then you uh, need to somehow like, classify this identifier. Is this like part of a pattern or is this expression or maybe like a struct field? And looking at the parents uh, in this sense like, is useful. It's not crucial. Uh, so it's like it must have category, not in like absolutely must have, but it's a like, useful property. Yeah, I guess I would just, I feel like it is useful, but not for the reason that you say is maybe what I'm trying to say. Like in order to, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, you still have to search from the top to find where the cursor is, but one, it is just useful to be able to go to parents because then you don't have to pass up the whole. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that's true. Okay, so uh, yeah, one more like, kind of important property is ability to do incremental reparsing, and like incremental reparsing, uh, one part of incremental reparsing is like actual reparsing algorithm, which can like. Uh, rerun partial results, but another part is like the actual syntax tree structure, which you can like modify in place instead of like constructing uh, from the all the pieces. Uh, it's I actually don't think that this is like a too uh, really really crucially important thing because parsing of like you want usually to incrementally reparse only a single file, and parsing a single file is like fast enough, like it's like tens of milliseconds. It's like not uh, an extremely big delay. But of course, it's like would be more memory efficient and faster to just actually update the tree uh, instead of reparsing everything from scratch. Okay, so uh, that's like kind of like basic requirements. Let's take a look how uh, syntax tree and Rust analyzer work to like fit these requirements. Uh, but the rough plan is first of all to walk through uh, the API, like the high level public API of Syntax 3, uh, and then to go through the implementation of uh, the data structure which powers the Syntax 3, which is basically uh, the same data structure which is used in Roslyn or in Swift's new lib syntax. And then to walk through this incremental and error tolerant parsing bit and maybe take a look at how we actually use index trees inside of Rust Analyzer. Okay, so let's start with a public API. Uh, so here we have like some string which we have some Rust source code. And we parse this uh, string into a syntax tree. And kind of like one important requirement uh, that I like to achieve is that parsing should be independent from the semantic analysis of the compiler and that we should be able to parse some string in isolation without creating like some kind of like compiler session, et cetera, et cetera. We certainly will need to add some kind of like addition 2018 or something like that to account for addition, but I, I hope that like the addition is the single flag from the global state we need to parse files. So what we get uh, is actually a uh, source file struct, which represents the IST node for the whole file. And uh, due to the way ownership is set up, we get actually a smart pointer to the source file. So uh, tree arc is like just, it's like a usual arc, but it points to the whole tree. So like you can imagine, um, some kind of an application in Rust where is an important domain object is always held be behind an arc pointer. And so the code base always interacts with either arc of this thing or with a reference to this thing. And it never sees like the actual bare thing. This is what happens with syntax tree. You either see a reference to a node or a tree arc of node and you never see a bare node itself. So uh, all of these uh, IST nodes have like uh, usual API, like for example, in file we can iterate items where item can be like a struct, a function, et cetera, et cetera. So like, here is the list of items you can see inside a file. And we can extract a particular item, say like the first function definition 
and get a reference to it. Uh, although we started with an own version of the file, uh, over traversal always yields up uh, yields references. We, however, can create uh, an own version from the references. So this is like uh, shared from this, this from C++. You get a reference and you can get an own version of this reference, which is a cheap operation, which does not clone the whole syntax tree, but just bumps the uh, arc uh, counter for the tree itself. So yeah, now uh, we've got this function node. Uh, we can inspect its name, its body, uh, and we can get the expression from the body, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, one thing to, know, to note here is that uh, all of these functions uh, return options. So although like the name of the function is mandatory in Rust grammar, uh, here we get an option because uh, syntax tree is able to represent uh, partial nodes. And Uh, yeah, so here I have typed a function without a name, and in the syntax tree for uh, this function, I see this append def node, although like, the name is like mandatory. So wait, two things, actually a couple things, but let's start with the most recent. What yeah. is this like wizardry that you're showing us here? Is this some integration where you can see the parse tree or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is basically the parse tree of the file uh, I'm currently editing, and it's like uh -huh. updated life and kind of cool and nice. That is cool. Um, for the tree arc struct, is this basically like an unsafely implemented thing that keeps an arc to the root and then has like a pointer to something that's owned transitively by the root? Is that the idea? Uh, yes, we will go through the implementation like okay. in a little while. Yeah, but like, yeah, the idea is that like it's a bit of unsafe code, which I am not entirely sure is correct, but I hope is correct or could be made correct. <laughs> so it sounds good, okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we have we can inspect bits of trees, and this IST name is also like not an internal string which represents the name of the function, but an actual IST node with current pointers, offset, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so like this shows how we can use like struct like IST node mm -hmm. nodes. We can also have like a nice API for an anum uh, like. IST node. So, for example, here we uh, got an expression uh, for the block. So this would be one plus one, and we would like to know which kind of expression is this exactly. So we call a kind method and get back and anon with all various kind of expressions uh, we have. And this is like interesting bit uh, because we do not store IST directly as a like, tree of enums. So you can't uh, do nested partial matching. You can't, for example, uh, directly write a match expression for an expression, which is an addition where the uh, left-hand side is a cast operator or something like that. You need to do this like uh, one layer of matching at a time. But you still uh, can have this like, matching and exhaustive checking, et cetera, et cetera. And what's cool about it is that uh, it seems to me that when the line representation could actually be flexible, there is uh, no this uh, like export kind enum stored anywhere. It is like recreated on the fly. Yeah, so this bit is uh, basically all the API of the like typed layer of the IST, where you can get a node which has a particular type and it can some children or like a collection of children or it can be uh, one of the kind, et cetera, et cetera. There is also a so-called untyped layer for the IST, uh, where there is only a single type syntax node which can hold any node. So by calling a syntax method, we get a reference to a syntax node. And like what's also kind of cool and specific to this representation is that this syntax node is basically exactly the same as the expression node uh, we've got before. So every typed IST node is a transparent wrapper around the untyped syntax node. And what it's, uh, so it doesn't store any additional fields, et cetera, et cetera. It only gives you 
static information about what kinds of fields are available for the syntax node. So you actually can get a reference to a syntax node from a reference to an expression uh, due to the fact that this is marked as wrapper transparent. Yeah, so like this wrapper transparent bit is important and this unsafe impulse is also important to cast between the references. We can also get uh, in the opposite direction from the untyped node to typed node, uh, the uh, cast operator, but uh, cast uh, obviously returns an option because you uh, don't know if this node actually presents expression or not. And yeah, the upcast also returns the references because of this, of this transparent thing. Uh, the, way, the way casting work is that each syntax node stores so-called syntax kind. Syntax, yeah. So syntax kind is a giant enum which holds all the various type of syntax node Rust has. It's both for tokens like parentheses, curly braces, etc., etc., et cetera, and for like bigger things like if expression, lambda expression, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, the cast operator basically checks that the kind of underlying syntax node matches the static kind of the IST expression and then just cast the stuff. Or if it doesn't match, it returns none. Yeah. So uh, this raw syntax contains a kind, it contains a text range. And uh, text range is actually an absolute range into the file, so it's both the start offset and the end offset. And this is like an interesting bit because the syntax tree does support incremental reparsing. And incremental reparsing and the ability to store absolute offsets uh, is like somewhat contradictory because when you modify part of the tree, you have to fix all the offsets downstream. And, uh, it actually is possible to do that, and with uh, like log n complexity, if you use the clever implementation from Roslyn and LibSyntax, we probably will talk about a bit later. But the general idea is that you calculate uh, these ranges lazily. So if you haven't calculated a particular range, you haven't to update it, and if you have to update the range, you it means that you have calculated it. And that means that like uh, average time to update all the ranges is actually constant because you've spent uh, some amount of credit to calculate in those ranges. Yeah. So uh, each syntax node also like contains the full fidelity text of the node, like exactly uh, the sequence of bytes that it that is in the source file. It doesn't like contains literally a reference to a text. Uh, but each token, each leaf token contains like a bit of text for this token. So you can get a uh, text for the node by just walking all the tokens left to right. It also contains uh, this generic API for traversing tree. You, get, you can get to the parent, to the first child, to the next sibling, and that allows you to get from any point to the tree to any other point of the tree. And this is like, kind of a property that you can get from here to there, which places like requirements on how the API might look like, because it means that you need some kind of a shared ownership. You can drop, uh, you can hold a reference to a node inside the file and drop all other nodes, because that would mean that parent things would be invalidated. Uh, in the current setup, uh, you also you always maintain the whole file. Okay, so obviously using this like basic atomic uh, methods, you can uh, build some nice traverses. For example, you can take all the ancestors of this expression node and find a function definition uh, among those ancestors. And here you can, for example, compare that. Yeah, this function we've got. Here is exactly the function we have started from over here. 
There's also like siblings and a way to walk up to it. Uh, it's interesting that, yeah, due to, the, due to the fact that we have parent pointers, we can actually implement uh, walking the subtree uh, using only a constant amount of memory. So you don't have to write a recursive traversal which maintains a stack. You can uh, do this in a single stack frame. There's like a nice pre order API which tells you, hey, we've entered this node and then we left this node, and it can be used to implement stuff like printing a tree and yeah basically this tree presentation is uh, implemented using this uh, pre-order method and enter leave events used to maintain indentation and here we actually see that we have this white space node explicitly in the tree uh yeah so usually when you traverse the tree you want like some kind of an uh, ist api to say visit every expression or visit every item or something like that in uh this setup the first way you can do it is to using the cast method so here i would like to collect all the expressions so i get uh, the raw syntax of the file and get all of the descendant nodes of the file and field and cast a node to expression, take only those results that are sum and get text, etc. It's also possible to do a visitor style API. It's possible to implement visitor as uh, like some trait which you have to implement, which has all methods defaulted. But I kind of try to do this in a more cute way where you can write a type directed visitor so you write like i'd like to visit a fan dev and you supply a lambda which accepts a fan dev and you can do something about it so this is again works because uh each fan dev knows uh, its syntax kind so because the visitor knows that it has to work a fan dev it knows that it has to look at the node with this particular syntax kind and yeah it works so this so it's kind of like a builder pattern for visitors yes yeah, a builder pattern for visitors because you just like can supply it a lambda and it will figure out the types it's cute it's cool it's cute it's cute but like actually in practice it's not much better than just using cast because it doesn't buy you a lot of type safety because you still get this like you get none in default case so just i in practice i typically use casting yeah well, i guess it depends how many things you're yeah but you, you can you can totally make like a more type more strongly typed visitor where you have to overwrite each expression or something like that it's probably like actually not too important because the bulk of the analysis uh, does not actually uh, operate on this syntax tree directly. The syntax tree are distributed into more lower level representation, which we'll talk about shortly. Well, not shortly, but talk about it. Okay, so are there any questions about this high level API? Because we are going to dive into implementation right now. Okay, so let's. Uh, let's dive into implementation. Well, first bit is what I've already shown you is that each syntax node is actually a wrapper around a raw syntax node. And this actually is all generated from this data file in ROM format. So it's like just an interesting detail. Ron being Rust object notation or something? Yeah, 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 Rust object notation. Just like some random format. And it's actually like kind of pretty big files, like 5,000 lines of syntax nodes. I'm glad I have not to write it by hand. Okay, so the implementation of the actual data structure lives in the Rowan crate. And here's actual source code of the Roman crate. Uh, the representation is two layered. 
Uh, it contains the purely functional so-called green tree, which does not store offset or parent pointers. And it contains a lazy layer of syntax node or red nodes, which contains parent pointers and absolute offsets, but is lazily populated. So let's start with a green node. It's not too interesting. Basically, a green node is either a token uh, which has a uh, text and a syntax kind. Uh, this uh, t colon colon kind is what was syntax kind in Rust analyzer because this library is sort of generic, this parameterized on this type parameter. It also can be a branch, and because this uh, green node should be cheaply updatable, we are using arc here. So you can imagine that like you can. Uh, substitute a single child in some node and this will clone only some of the nodes and not a whole tree. So the branch contains uh, the total length, which is uh, a sum of lengths of children. It also contains a kind and it contains an array of children. The uh, Swift representation actually uh, uses a cool trick with LLVM trailing objects here in uh, Swift. Uh, this basically is a single uh, allocation. It's a dynamically sized type where children are stored just after the node itself. So there is no implementation in implementation of this trick here yet, but it could be probably added once we had user-defined DSTs. So like, just a usual immutable syntax tree. Uh, nothing interesting here. Do we have method to replace. No, I wonder where are the methods for replacement, but they probably should be somewhere. Just to restate, I think this is what you said. The green tree kind of is the underlying tree. It only has information downward, right? Like about its children, so that it can be relocated in some kind of incremental reparse without. Yes, it can be relocated. It can also be shared about like uh, between different high level trees. So this is not actually implemented, but you can imagine that if you have the same one plus one in two places in the syntax tree, uh, you can actually use the same green node for both instances of one plus one. Mm -hmm. In okay. other words, green nodes, nodes do not have identity. Yes. Yeah. The syntax nodes have identity. And here we are getting to this bit of unsafe code, which allows you for tree arc thing. So syntax node, uh, it stores a, a reference to a green node. It also stores a reference to a parent. And it stores a reference to the uh, root of the syntax tree. And the idea is that all syntax nodes are owned by the root of the tree. So when the root goes away, uh, all syntax nodes go away. And we must make sure that uh, as long as we have a reference to a syntax node, the uh, root itself is always alive. The root itself is not a syntax node, it's just uh, some special data structure which contains, uh, the, which owns the nodes itself. And uh, here I use the arena as an optimization, but it's like not a really crucial bit of the implementation. And it also contains uh, an arbitrary data structure which you can associate with the tree itself. In Rust Analyzer, uh, I store syntax errors, like the actual messages in this root data field, but I actually now think that probably this is a bad design and they should be, and syntax errors should probably be stored completely separate from the tree itself. Like parsing process should produce a pair of a syntax tree and a set of errors. But it's probably not important. OK. So yeah, uh, the interesting bit here is, of course, laziness. And this is achieved uh, via this lazy node data structure. So uh, this uh, lazy node uh, is sort of an alpater until you looked at it. And when you looked uh, into this lazy node, we actually allocate a new syntax node, set up its parent, green node, et cetera, et cetera. This happens in get child method. 
So if we want to get a child of syntax node, we look at this lazy node. And if this lazy node already exists, we just return it. Otherwise, uh, we uh, take the green child with the appropriate index and allocate a new child node, a new syntax node child. And here we can actually uh, set up the parent pointer, the start offset, and all this other information which does not work with incremental reparsing. Uh, okay, so this lazy node is based on swap cell, which is like kind of a lazy cell uh, which has some unsafe code and theory immutability so that you can get either get a value or initialize it with some function. And the another interesting bit besides the laziness is how do you actually maintain this invariant that as long as you have a syntax node, uh, you have a root of a tree alive as well. There is where this tree arc type comes in. So a tree arc is a type which stores a reference to a single node inside the tree. So this inner is a pointer to the node inside the tree, not to the root. But it also makes sure that uh, when you create a tree arc, it actually bumps the arc pointer. Let me show this problem. Yeah. So here, uh, if we uh, get have a reference to a node inside the tree, we can wrap this node into an own version using a tree arc. And to do that, we uh, manually bump the pointer to the tree itself. And then we create a tree with a pointer. Conversely, in drop, we decrement the counter, and this uh, could potentially drop the whole tree. Yeah, so like the initial reference count of one we get in the new root method, where we get a, a green node, which is like fully immutable, blah, blah, blah node. We get this uh, arbitrary user specified data at the root pointer, and we get a syntax node for this root. So we first uh, create a root, we put it into an arc pointer. So we get reference count one, and we uh, create a tree arc manually without bumping arc uh, the second time, pointing to this red node inside. And we also use some mutability to, yeah, to actually set up a parent pointer. Uh, because, why do we need parent pointer here? Yeah, because, we need parent pointer to the root because when we are allocating new child, we have to, yeah. When we're allocating uh, children, uh, we have to ask the arena at the root to allocate the list of children. So like, there are a bit of details here, like why do we, store with text unity in swap cell, but it's probably not important. The general idea, I hope, is clear at this point. Yeah, any questions here? I have a slight question. Um, in the arena, first of all, uh, like in this implementation, I guess, the so for, you're allocating the memory for the trees from an arena or a partial like mix partly from the arena and partly from the heap like the arcs are kind of on the heap i guess so uh, uh, green nodes are always allocated on the heap and the syntax node are allocated on the arena because for green nodes i want the ability to take a sub tree and drop the rest of the tree for this node i have to maintain the whole tree anyway because i want parent pointers to work so it makes sense to allocate them on the arena when when there's an incremental update, do you also in, do you trash the entire syntax node layer? Uh, yeah. Arena? 
yeah, for incremental updates, uh, the entire syntax node layer is trashed. And this, like, this operation can actually be O uh, for N. Like, you can trust the whole syntax file. But because to create this whole syntax file, you have to traverse it first, that like uh, average to constant update nevertheless. Like for example, if user typed something and you have inspected only uh, the particular function to like do syntax coloring and then user typed something else, you don't have the whole syntax tree layer in memory. You have the syntax tree layer only for this particular function. So it's cheap to update. I'm like, I'm not entirely sure that all this complexity is actually required because this incremental parsing is not a major use case because typically you read files once and uh, they are never modified. Only a small amount of files are modified. And for that files, like even from scratch, uh, from scratch your parsing is not too costly, but mm -hmm. it wasn't too difficult to implement and, well, why not? And another thing is that uh, I've talked about, when I've talked about atoms, I was talking about, you can't do nested atoms matching, but you can change representation of the tree. And this is actually the place where we can take advantage of that. We can uh, imagine a second rep representation of the implementation where you allocate both the green nodes and the syntax nodes in a single arena. And maybe not even like green nodes and syntax nodes, but some kind of a third kind of like yellow node, which is like eagerly computed blah, blah, blah node. And you can like, uh, the IST layer does not, the IP of IST layer does not expose these underlying details. Right, and you might do that for like create IO content or something that you know will not be edited later. Yeah. So. Uh, well, I have a few questions, but I'm wondering um, before I ask them, because I think they might be better to leave till the end, are you planning to present also other things built on top of this? I remember we talked, for example, about like these higher level uh, view on Rust code, this sort of uh, Rust. Yeah, I plan to do that actually. Uh, how many times? Oh, we are almost out of time. Uh, oh, well, time flies. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, let me just briefly talk about the parsing and high-level stuff and maybe leave the questions to the like, time yeah, at the end. I think that's better. I'd, I'd be happy to ask the questions you know, on Zulip also if it comes to that. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, first of all about parsing. Uh, like the cool thing about parser is that actually it is independent from the syntax tree. So uh, the syntax tree itself lives in array syntax crate and parser depends basically on nothing. And it communicates with the rest of the analyzer using basically these two traits for a token source and tree sync. And this kind of works nice with this untyped tree representation because a uh, tree synth is untyped. It says that like, I have started this kind of syntax tree and not like a struct with this field, blah, 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 blah. So it kind of works together nicely. And parsing is not like too interesting. Let me just briefly show how error recovery works. Do we have, oh, it's nominal. Yeah, so uh, here we see a code for parsing struct definition. And uh, first thing is that, yeah, we actually allow struct to miss the name. And the strategy we use here is that if we are trying to parse a name and we see a token from uh, this set, we don't actually consume the next token. So if we have like, struct something and a fan foo. So we see here that the function syntax node is presented completely correctly because after the struct we haven't consumed this fan token. But if we have like something unrelated like 92 
we interpret this 92 as an error now. So just basically some heuristic to understand when we should uh, see that token is mistyped or when the token is actually part of the next, next item. And another trick for error recovery is that when we are parsing a list of things, we basically just ignore all the errors and uh, just skip tokens until we actually see the closing brace. So it allows us to isolate errors and it does not matter what garbage I'm going to type here, uh, the syntax tree underneath will be left intact. One, one question I have about that. I, yeah. I've thought about that strategy a lot. And it, it seems obvious, but if you're missing a closing brace, it could go very wrong, right? Do you have some trick to like recover? Like if you encounter, I don't know, what looks like a new item? No, no. Basically, you see here that when I'm adding the closing brace, the syntax highlighting mm -hmm. starts to work. And when I erase it, like everything breaks, but it like it's it shouldn't be too important practice because the analysis time for a file should be like under a second, under 30, 300 milliseconds, ideally. Yeah. I it seems like the, the syntax highlighting actually provides a nice feedback for the user that like, PS, I didn't recognize this correctly. Like, yeah, probably. and that like, <laughs> gi given that yeah. syntax highlighting works like instantly for parsing errors, it's like kind of a nice user experience. Right, yeah, it's yeah. good. So uh, let's uh, see how we actually use this parsing uh, to do some analysis. Yeah. So uh, the trick is that we don't actually, like using these trees for analysis would be bad because trees store absolute offsets and absolute offsets are destroyed by every edit. So if you use this node as a salsa K, you have to compute everything, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, when we want to do something with a tree, we go via lowering process. For example, to type check a function, we lower a function syntax to this body representation, which contains expressions, but in this like uh, yes, yes style representation. And here the expression is like actual, an actual enum, and it uh, does not contain optional stuff, so like, each expression, like if expression has condition and has event branch and they're not options, but we allow special missing expression to express what expression is missing. Uh, some joke about my English. Yeah. And we have basically a function which takes a syntax and IST with parent pointers, et cetera, et cetera, and converts it to this uh, anon based representation and just uh, recursively walks the tree and uh, allocates stuff on this ID arena, et cetera, et cetera. And the bottom line is that because this representation does not contain offsets of parent pointers or stuff like that, it is not, it, doesn't change when you type something before a function, so it is not validated. And it probably also is more memory efficient because we don't store white space here. So we can uh, take a syntax tree uh, for a file, convert all functions to this representation, and then we can throw away the syntax tree and probably recreate the syntax tree later when we actually need them. And to maintain the mapping, uh, between uh, this representation and syntax tree, we used so-called source map pattern, where we basically store a hash map uh, between these expressions and the syntax node in the original source tree. Although we don't store the literal syntax node because we want to be able to free the memory, and if we store the syntax node, we store an arc pointer to the root of the tree, etc. etc we store basically an offset and a kind of a syntax node. So we, when we actually need the node, we can recreate it by parsing the source again and walking the tree, finding the offset. Yeah, so that's basically everything I wanted to cover. Um, 
so this last, first of all, does anyone else have any other questions <laughs> before I ask you? The, okay, the last, the last point of the design kind of gets at what I wanted to ask about, which was kind of the incremental story. And it feels to me like, mm, it's kind of a minor point in some sense, but it feels like the, the intermediate node, which has to be rebuilt, actually contains a lot more information than I suspect you need a lot of the time in the form of absolute offsets and so forth. You need, you need some way to get an absolute offset, but it may not have to be like in the tree. And I know they're computed lazily, so maybe it doesn't matter because you throw away the whole syntax tree. But uh, I'm, I don't know, maybe this isn't a specific question and I should try to write down a proposal or something, but it feels to me like we could tune this essentially for, for a salsa-like style to get better incremental reuse across compilations. Um, but, the, well, let me come back, let me forget that point for one second and dial back to the, the, the single biggest question I had, which was one, which is related, which is that one part of your syntax tree had the premise that you can sort of get from any node in the syntax tree to any other node. And that's not, it seems to be obviously desirable. Uh, in fact, I think it has some, some, some downsides. Like you might want to, and specifically around incremental basically, and what we might want to do instead is to make it so that it's more like a tree of trees or a forest or something. Uh, the idea being that when I get the tree, say for a particular item, like a function or a struct, yes, I can navigate within that item freely, but if I want to exit the item, I have to go back to to the API to some extent. Uh, and the reason for that being that then we can track more closely which parts of the tree did you actually look at. So when we do an incremental update, we might see like, indeed this impl, like you never even looked at that impl, so who cares that it changed or this function and so on. Um, and maybe that, that kind of all comes out, I guess, through the expression. I can imagine that later layers in this salsa mapping kind of achieve that same effect, but it might be something we want to think about pushing earlier, I think. Yeah, probably. Like my current thought is that these body syntax mapping representation gets you exactly that. You can inspect the body, but you can't uh, look outside of it, and you have to have salsa database somewhere to get to the owner of this body. And like, like the idea is that like this syntax tree contains as much representation as possible to make the writing ID, to write, make writing refactorings as convenient as possible, but that we are always eager to discard it. Ideally, we should like build a syntax tree for a single file and then discard it and build a syntax tree for the next file. This probably won't work with macro expansion. Or probably it like, could to some extent, but I, I, I do think that probably we can uh, tweak this and move incremental bits closer to actual parsing. Yeah, I guess it seems okay. I ju it just seems like a little baked in inefficiency that is not obviously necessary or more or even that much more convenient. Like we might instead say that we, you know, you, you have all that information, but you have to sort of ask for it so that we don't, it's kind of, in some sense, maybe moving some of that lazy rebuilding out from the unsafe code and into salsa. <laughs> but yes, uh, if I have a couple of minutes, I'd like to kind of show a bit of code where I think this like ability to navigate to parents, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is like especially important. Yeah. So this is a bit of completion infrastructure, and the task of the bit is figuring out what the identifier at the position actually is about. And so here we basically get this thing that like, hey, we have an identifier, but let's look at the parent. And if this, is, uh, is, if this happens to be a named field, then uh, we are inside of like struct literal, like this thing, which you type inside expression. Otherwise, Let's take a look at the ancestors uh, and see here yeah, if we are at the top level in some sense, or if we're inside a function, that sort of stuff. So this, like, I definitely feel that the API I was showing in the API walkthrough 
is a useful uh, model for the ID because it's simple. You just get parents, children, etc., etc. Uh, the implementation could totally change, and it wouldn't be too bad if all of these functions uh, will have to get the database argument or something. But it would make it less nice, and it actually would make this. Uh, like less constrained because if you have a reference to a salsa database, you can get anywhere in the types, in the macros, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Here syntax tree is pretty much isolated from salsa, so there's zero semantic information in syntax tree, and this kind of valuable as well. Could be valuable as well. Yeah, that makes sense. I guess I have to think about it. One other question: What have you built atop this? Like, have you? I do, assume you don't have like some take on Rust format or anything like that, because that would be incredible. But or do you? <laughs> I'm basically trying to figure out how much have. It would be interesting to see sort of examples where it was you know each of the case capabilities was used and what for. I, I have a certain like uh, better of examples, like for example. Uh, one nice feature is that if I call join lines uh, function in Rust Analyzer, it like actually removes this trailing comma for me because it works on syntax trees. Mm -hmm. Probably can actually. Yeah, and here we actually use this capability of. Uh, get into the previous sibling and check in that uh, if this, this is a comma and the next node is a closing brace, let's just remove this comma. Yep. I want to build a Rust from a tree on top of this tree. So it's like, uh, this is actually, uh, why I am interested in nailing down uh, this uh, particular aspect of Rust analyzer in some more detail, because if we are final about the design of the syntax tree, we can actually start building stuff on top of this, and we can start thinking about like how do we move Rust C to use these trees or something like that. It yeah. seems like somewhat isolated from like hard harder bits like name resolution or macro expansion. Or right. something like that. Yeah, but it's very of course, foundational. Of course, the biggest uh, question here is how do we do macro expansion using these trees? I have like some uh, some draft code here which uh, can actually take a token tree and produce an IST node without actually going via text representation because I have this like tree sync token source abstraction for parsing but it doesn't, for example, handle hygiene too well. Like uh, in this uh, token tree representation, each token has an identity, but in this source tree, because it only remembers like, tokens, like, like the text of the token, I can't say that this name in this struct came from this token. It like, somehow has to be implemented elsewhere. Mm. I don't quite understand why you can't do that because you don't have a way to sort of splice the tokens to indicate that they came from another, they were spliced well, in from somewhere else. Or? Uh, no. What I'm trying to say is that uh, syntax tree currently does not contain any semantic information and hygiene isn't some self semantic information. Uh, we can either build hygiene into the tree itself or we can maintain a site table. And like I'm currently leaning towards maintaining a site table for that, but that like, needs to be implemented. In general, there's like, it's not just about hygiene. I mean, in general, we, the spans in Rusty at least have a sort of tree structure to them, right? Like a stack structure so that we can say things like, we, we use this internally to say things like, we desugared a for loop into a while loop. But when you see this while loop, like, is compiler generated from this original source, 
do you have any notion of, of handling that kind of uh, information? Would that also be a side table, I guess? Yeah, so it's actually on, on the tree, it's like called a token map and uh, like it's like not really works. It's just some draft code. But the idea is that each token has uh, an identity, basically an integer. And we can, for example, map uh, each token in the token tree to the source span where this token came from and we can kind of maintain that back. But I like don't have the general span notion and I probably would like to avoid spans because it seems to me that spans don't work quite well with incremental compilation. I'd like kind of I would try to maintain a more fine grade IDs like expression ID, function ID something like that. But for macro expansion, yeah, we need some kind of a more general mapping between tokens. Okay. Cool. This was super helpful. Thank you, Alex. Yeah. Yeah, I, I probably like it, it probably should be on video that this is really based on the uh, implementation of the Swift and Swift has a really way to me explaining this red green setup. So if you don't understand anything I was talking about, it makes sense to read that first and then watch the video. Unfortunately, it will be in the end of the video. So, yeah. Cool. Well, shall we cut it here? Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Bye.